Okay, I know I was really hard on you in the last session about getting up early every day to meet with Jesus. And I'm sure you are asking yourself about now, is it really worth it? Well, stay tuned to session five and you will find out. to session five that's called Natural Consequences of Seeking God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that word consequences, it sounds negative. But a consequence can be positive. And in this session, I want to share with you about all of the positive consequences that will happen in your life just naturally. You can't get out of it no matter what because you've chosen to seek God first. You know, many years ago, 2005, when I felt God calling me to put together a workshop, a workshop that would encourage people to open their Bibles and that would equip them and show them how to have a daily quiet time, I said to God, I said, you know, God, I know you've given me a story that will help them want to open their Bible. And I know that you have enabled me to encourage people to be in the Word. But hey, I need some good reasons to share with them what will happen in their life if they do these things. I need some motivation here to kind of seal this message. And so what I did was I sat there and I said, God, what are some of the things that I've noticed that you've done for me over this past year as a result of seeking you first. And immediately I just started writing down things that I noticed that he caused to happen in my life without me even trying. And so what we're going to look at in this particular session is just a few of the natural consequences of the choice of seeking God first. Number one, the number one thing that will be a natural consequence reward in your life is that you will know Him. It cannot be helped. And I love this verse in John 17, verse 3, where Jesus is praying to the Father and He says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I'll never forget the day that verse came alive to me for two reasons. The first thing was that he said, now this is eternal life. See, I grew up thinking that I couldn't have eternal life till I died. But notice the tense. It says, now this is eternal life. What is? Knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ. That is what brings me life. And the other thing that stuck to me was he said, I can know God. I really can know God. That blows my mind. I don't even think I get that sometimes. But he says it in his word. I can know him. Now, you know, there's this beautiful young girl over here. Her name is Valerie. I happened to meet her when I was speaking at her high school a couple years ago. And I know a little bit about her just by the few minutes we have spent together. First of all, I can tell she is so beautiful and she has this gorgeous smile. And I happen to know that she is adopted and she is a great joy to her parents who have been incredible people of impact and influence in her life. And I praise the Lord for your parents. And I know that she's a senior in high school and I know she loves the Lord. But that is all I really know about her with the little bit of time we spent together. But suppose after today, her and I talk and we say, hey, let's get to know each other a little bit better. Let's talk on the phone every morning before uh, I go to school, she'll say, and I'll, I'll give you 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. Let's just talk. 
So we commit to that, and we decide we're going to do that for three months. So three months, we call and we talk to each other every morning for just 20, 30 minutes. Will I not just naturally know Valerie better than I do right now? It can't be helped. It's a natural consequence. Suppose Valerie and I decide, hey, we kind of like this. We're getting to like each other. We want to spend more time together. Let's go for a year. Let's just hang out on the phone for an entire year for 20 minutes every morning. So we stick to that decision. How much more will I know Valerie a year from now? I will be able to tell you so many wonderful things about this girl because I made the decision that I wanted to know her and we spent time together. Isn't it exciting to think that we can know God in the same way? If just every day we get up and say, I just want to spend some time with you today, Jesus, and you just stick with it every day, it can't be helped. You will know him so much better months from now. And you know, the reason why people don't talk about Jesus very much is because they don't spend any time with him. If you don't spend time with Jesus, you really don't have much to say. You can't talk about someone effectively if you don't know them. And there is only one way to know them, and that is spend time with them. So praise Jesus. You can know him. It's just up to you. But you must make the choice, and it will be the natural reward. The natural reward of spending time with God. You know, there is a sad verse in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 4.22. And listen to what God says about his people. He says, my people are fools. They do not know me. That's what God said about his people. But I like the verse in Jeremiah 24 7 where he says I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord I want you to think about that Jeremiah 24 7 make that your prayer that 24 7 God will give you a heart to want to know him that he is the Lord 24-7. That's what we want. Number two, a natural consequence of spending time with God every day is that you will be transformed. It cannot be helped. Romans 12, 2, Paul tells us, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, you know, I'd give anything as a Christian that God would transform my mind just like that. It would all be done in one second. But you see, transformation of the mind is a continuing process. We are continually transformed as we spend time in the Word. There is a verse in 2 Corinthians 7, 1 that says, Let us purify ourselves from everything, everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We live in a day where our culture spends many, many, many hours watching movies and television. And I'm going to venture to say a huge percent of that is contamination of the mind. 
Now, we all go around and we say we want the mind of Christ. Oh, God, I just want your mind. But I would like to suggest to you that if in a week's period of time you have spent five hours watching some movies and television that have some contamination in it, and you spend two hours in the Word of God, in truth. Let's think about this. Two hours in the Word, five hours with the world's mind. And you do that for four weeks. Two hours with God, five hours with the world. I want to ask you, whose mindset do you think you will lean towards? See, the lie of the enemy is, oh, you can watch this and that. It won't really contaminate you. You're a Christian. You love God. It is a lie. Every time you allow yourself to watch garbage, you are being contaminated. And I used to say to my kids, you know, I didn't always approve of everything they watched. But I said, hey, fine, go ahead and watch that. But then you better balance that out and spend double time in God's Word to clean up your mind. You know, every day I used to start my morning with coffee and reading the newspaper. And when I cried out to God about wanting to seek Him, but I didn't have time, I was walking down my driveway one morning to get the newspaper, and as I was walking up the hill, it was like He bopped me in the head, and He said, Right there, Anita, you start your day with that newspaper that is full of bad news. And you feel depressed and scared after you're done reading it. Put the paper down. Pick up my good news. Spend time in my good news that when you put it down, you leave full of joy and life and hope. And then if you have time, you can read the bad news. See, we can't help the world we live in. We are surrounded by contamination. I can't even go to the grocery store without, you know, my eyes. I start reading the covers of all those trash magazines. So please be aware, and I'm not trying to tell you you can't watch any movies or any television. I'm just wanting you to understand this concept. If you spend more hours on a consistent basis filling your mind with what is contamination, then it can't be helped. You will have the world's mind instead of Christ's mind. I got a beautiful letter from a young lady, and I won't read it all to you. But this was after she had attended a joy shop, and she took the 21-day challenge, which I'm going to introduce in the next session. But this is what she wrote to me. Dear Anita, wow, I just completed the 21-day challenge in John yesterday, and has it ever changed my life? I wrote to you earlier in the month, how much uh, I was in depression. Well, not anymore. You know the hymn, Jesus is the joy of living. Well, it has become true in my life. I wake up wanting to hop into the Word of God. And as I read and use the Joy Shop bookmark in my devos, I have gone from 20 minutes to two hours. And then she has in parentheses, glad I'm a stay-at-home mom. And then she goes on to say, a few things have happened. My Attitude in life has completely transformed. This is all from just spending 21 days with Jesus in his word. My house is livable again. Things are getting done. My health is improving. And she has in parentheses, I have four incurable diseases. And she goes on to say that her life is a blessing. And she said she was on a lot of pills and now she's slowly getting down to one and that Jesus has just become the joy in her life. My cup is full and running over. I have a joy unspeakable. Only the Lord has given me this joy, and I'm excited to share it. See, as we get under the influence of God's Word and His truth, He starts transforming our mind. Now, this does not mean that you will not have any problems in your life. It's, this does not mean you might not ever struggle with a mental illness. 
What this means is that in your situation, whatever it is, God can transform your attitude in the way you're dealing with your situation. Does that make sense? So he doesn't transform our life to where we don't have any problems. He transforms our mind and our attitude so that we can have a Christ-like mind in our difficult circumstances that we are in. Next point, number three. You will do his will. It can't be helped. You will just naturally start doing his will. This verse that we're going to look at used to scare me. Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, it is my heart's desire that I always do God's will immediately. But you know what? I don't. There are times it takes me a week to do God's will. It might take me two years to do God's will in a particular situation. But as we seek God and spend time with Him, what starts happening is He starts giving us this desire to want to do His will, and then He gives us the courage to do His will. Many years ago, when my first daughter was getting married, I found out that the mother of the bride dress is very important. Now, I don't like to shop, and I was all nervous about this dress I had to get. Well, one day we were at the bridal shop, and the owner of the bridal shop, she asked me if I had my dress yet. And I said, no, I don't have it yet. And she said, oh, I have the dress that has your name on it. So she brings it out, and it was beautiful. And I wanted it, but I took one look at that price tag, And now I didn't say this to her, but inside I'm saying, there's no way I'm paying that kind of money for a dress. I graciously declined it and walked out. Well, to make a long story short, I ran out of time and I didn't have a dress yet. And we were down to the wire. And I was at the bridal shop again with my two daughters and my two boys. And the lady asked me again, do you have your dress? And now fear came over me. And I'm like, no, I don't. She said, well, you know, you are down to the wire. I pulled out my credit card and said, okay, order the dress. Now, the whole time, I'm feeling horrible that I am spending this much money on a dress. And my only prayer was, oh, God, please don't let my husband ask me what this dress costs. Now, these are the kind of prayers that God usually doesn't answer. But anyway, (laughs) that was my prayer. So we go home, and that afternoon, all the children and my husband, uh, we, we jump in our van, and we're heading down the road to go out to eat. And, of course, one of my kids opened their big mouth, and they said, Mom got her dress today. And my husband's driving. He said, Oh, what it cost. <laughs> now, in that moment, see, I knew what God's will was. God's will is to tell the truth. But I didn't want to tell the truth. And see, the battle began in my mind. You know, tell the truth and die, (laughs) lie and live. (laughs) And you know what I'm talking about? I stalled as this battle went on back and forth. Tell the truth, no, don't tell the truth. Back and forth I went because I knew I should tell the truth, but I was afraid to tell the truth. And so I stalled a little bit and I said, ah, I don't want to tell you what I paid. And so I I knew, you know, I had to come forth at some point, but I needed more time to make the decision of whose will I was going to do. Now see, years ago, before I started spending time and prioritizing being with God, do you know what I would have done? Sad to say, I would have just automatically probably slipped out and made up a price that was cheaper than what I had paid because I didn't want to own up to what I had spent on a dress. But see, now I knew I wanted to please God. And so finally I knew I had to tell Him the truth. (laughs) And I finally blurted it out. (laughs) And as you can see, I'm still living. (laughs) And bless my husband's heart. He said, well, (laughs) in that case, that can be your birthday present this year. And it was so bad, I said, oh, make it birthday and Christmas, you know. But I share this story so that you understand it is hard to do God's will. 
But God will give you the desire to want to do His will and give you the courage to do it. You know, one thing I would just like to say here, there's many young people here in the audience, and so often I hear young people and adults who will say, I'm so worried I will miss what God's will is for my life. So many people worry about, what if I'm not in God's will at this moment doing what He wants me to do? I want to assure you that God's will is wherever you are at this moment, He wants you to love others. That is His will, that you love the family that you are in that you love the co-workers you work with, that you love uh, the people in your church. It's all about love. So anytime you are loving on others, you are in His will. Number four. You will be equipped for every good work. You will be equipped... For every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has a good work that he wants you to do that he has equipped you to do. Now, a good work that he has equipped you to do is that I will call natural gift that is within you. That one thing that you love to do, nobody has to pay you to do it. You just find great joy in doing it, whatever that thing is. That is a gift that God has put in you because he wants to use it for his kingdom. Now, our problem is we categorize gifts by what we think some gifts are better than others. Some gifts are more important or more spiritual than others. You know, I grew up in a pastor's home and my dad had the gift of preaching, and my mother had the gift of being a musician. My mother can play the piano, the organ, the harp, and she does it all to the glory of God. See, God has put that in her, and it just flows out of her. Well, growing up in a pastor's home where you see gifts coming out of your parents, I developed this false misconception in my mind that if I truly surrendered my life to God, he would make me marry a missionary, move to Africa, live in a hut with no plumbing, and horrors of horrors have to play an organ. <laughs> now, I don't know how you'd play an organ if there's not electricity in a hut, but Nonetheless, in my little brain, that is what I thought I would have to do myself if I surrendered my life to the Lord. Well, meantime, growing up, I didn't, I didn't want to play the piano. My mother wanted all of us children to play the piano, and she had good reasons, but I could not stand practicing piano. I was so bad during lessons, my mother would have to pray over me because I was rebellious. I didn't want to play a piano. But now this is embarrassing when I tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a cheerleader. <laughs> and so in eighth grade, I went out for cheerleading. I was so excited. I so bad wanted to be one of those people that cheers the team on. So I tried out, and I still remember sitting in that room, and the loudspeaker blaring with the principal making the announcement of the names who made the cheerleading team and my name was not on it. I didn't make the team. I was so crushed. So I was determined I was going to make cheerleading next year. So every day I would go outside. Our house was next to the parsonage and it had big double glass doors 
And every day I would stand in front of that glass door where I could see my reflection and I would practice cheerleading. Straight arms. How high can I kick? How high can I jump? I mean, I really got into it. And I practiced so hard that when I went out for cheerleading in ninth grade, not only did I make the team, but I had the highest score because I just desired to be a cheerleader. Years later, God showed me, Anita, I put that cheerleading gift in you because, see, I want you to cheer the church on to seeking God. Listen, you can get up. You can seek God first. And it brings me so much joy to be able to stand up here and cheer you on. You go. You can do this. And I'll spare us all the embarrassment of doing a cheerleading jump at this moment <laughs> because I would love to, but my heels are too high. Anyway, God has put a gift within you that you enjoy. And see, he wants to use that to build and support the kingdom of God. And see, the reason he gives gifts to people, whatever they are, are not so that they might look good. See, he gives gifts for serving the body. We are to serve the body with our gifts. Which leads me to our next point. As you seek God and prioritize spending time with Him, you will be a servant and a witness. It cannot be helped. In this particular verse that is in your workbook, to just give you a little bit of background, Saul, who is now called Paul in the New Testament, he is with uh, some officials, and he is telling them his conversion story. He's on trial. And he's at the part where, you know, when Saul was out persecuting the Christians, and he was on his way to Damascus, and this bright light blinded him, and it was Jesus. And he's like, Saul, why are you doing this to me? Why are you persecuting me? And Paul cries out, what do you want from me? And this is what Jesus said to him. He said, I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. You know why I picked this verse out on serving? Because I think it is significant, the order of two words. He does not say, I've appeared to you to appoint you as a witness and a servant. He says, I've appeared to you and appointed you as a servant and a witness. And I want you to know, and this is just from my heart, that I sincerely believe that God calls us to first serve before we witness. Now, many people have the gift of evangelism, and we are all called to be a witness. But when people know your witness, okay, they know where you stand with the Lord, and, there's, and you just want so bad for some loved one some friend to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now is the time that you practice serving them. You just love on them and you keep serving them. And I guarantee as you serve them, God will provide an open door for you to be a witness. Because when he opens the door, they are ready to hear what you have to say. So often, people who we are trying to bring to Christ, after a while, they just put a wall up because they just don't want to hear it. They're not ready yet. And so that's when I say, gear up, gear up your acts of love and service towards that person. Just be there for them. Love on them. And wait and see what God will do. You know, I don't know about you, but how many of us who are married... We always try to influence our spouse spiritually. 
You know, we put little notes here or little devotionals here or, or with our children. You know, we so bad want our children to walk with God. And that is a good desire. But you know, but you know, you can only talk so much. And your teenagers, when they reach a certain age, you cannot make them choose to love Jesus. And you know, as a mother, even though I raised, my husband and I raised our children in the church, one of the fears that would come over me is, what if my children don't choose to walk with Christ? And that used to be a burden on my heart. And I used to get frustrated when they would do things I didn't think they should be doing. You're a Christian. Don't do that. Or, you know, you want to strangle them and say, have a daily quiet time. You know, you know you're trying to force these good things on them. And one day I just heard God say to me, Anita, stop worrying about the spiritual lives of all these loved ones. You're not the Holy Spirit. You love them. You serve them. You worry about yourself. You seek me. I'll take care of your family. You know, after so many years of meeting God in a certain chair in my living room, my children knew where I was every morning. And it was so cute. After a while, they would start putting notes on my chair. If they wanted me to do something for them or to wake them up or whatever. See, they knew where I was going to be. And so I didn't have to say a thing. They just knew. And I praise God today that he's put within all my children and my wonderful husband. They all love God. They're all seeking God. And you know what? He didn't need my big mouth to help make that happen. He just told me, you're responsible for you. You love on your family and you serve your family and you leave the outcome to me. He has a plan. Next point. Number six, when you prioritize that time with God, listen, you will have joy. His joy. Not the kind of joy that the world gives, but the joy that Jesus gives. 1 Peter 1, 8, I love this verse because really it's talking about you and I. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Wonderful quote. Every bit of knowledge that we have of God fills us with ineffable, undescribable joy. We get joy not from our circumstances. We get joy from the presence of God in our lives. He is our joy. You know, there's many days... <laughs> that I have hurt in my life and I'm sorrowful about things and I feel burdened about things and I don't feel too happy. But when I go to my chair with God and I shed a few tears there with Him, He does bring His joy because joy is being in His presence. He's my joy and I know that He never changes. My life changes. My circumstances change. I never know what's around the corner. But when we have Jesus, see, we have joy. And that joy comes from intimacy with him, his presence in our life. Number seven, another consequence of seeking God first, you will be a blessing to others. Genesis 12, 2, and you will be a blessing. You know, I looked up that word blessing in the dictionary, and one of the definitions is a gift of God. Now, isn't that a cool thought? Wouldn't you like your family to think that you were a gift of God to them? Wouldn't you like where you work or in your school or in your church that people would see you and they would say, there goes 
a gift of God. You see, this can't be helped. When you prioritize this intimacy with Jesus, He causes you just naturally to be a blessing to others. And you know what? You don't need people to come up and say, you blessed me today to, to know that this is true. You just can know it is true. It can't be helped. You will just naturally bless people. Many years ago, my husband and I used to spend some weekends away at a cabin uh, in another state. And we used to love going to this tiny little church that had about 20 people in. And whenever our whole family and friends would go, we were more than half the congregation sometimes. But I love this sweet little church because everything was just so simple. And this particular Sunday, we went in and church was full. There was like 45 people there. And we we're like, wow, it's not even Christmas. You know, what's going on? Well, here this particular morning, they had special music. Now, you don't understand. They didn't even have a piano player. You know, if someone showed up at church and could play the piano, then they had a pianist. But on this particular Sunday, they had a couple who wanted to sing. So this couple came up, and they sang this gospel song about don't get on the black long train or something like that. Anyway, they're singing this song from the bottom of their heart, but they're making mistakes left and right. Now, the whole time I'm watching them, I'm like, ooh, that was a bad note. Ooh, they skipped there, you know. And every time they made a mistake, they just look at each other and they just smile and keep going. Well, in that moment, see, God gave me his eyes. And they blessed me because, see, they were singing unto Jesus with all they had, with the best ability they could do. It was so sweet. Well, then there happened to be an older gentleman sitting beside me. And he was at the end of the pew. And he was hooked up to an antique breathing apparatus. He couldn't breathe, and he had oxygen tanks there. And this thing was noisy. And I could hear him breathe. It was just so bugging me. Have you ever wanted to give somebody the dirty eye? You know, it's like I kind of wanted to go like this and say, stop breathing, please, for 20 minutes. I want to hear the message. I mean, that was my flesh. But then Jesus gave me his eyes, and I heard him say to me, I need to look at that man. See, that man was sitting there with his worn Bible open on his lap. And he, Jesus said to me, Anita, most people stay home with a cold. This man, in my mind, was half dead. <laughs> and he was there in church because he wanted to be with other worshipers. And see, God gave me his eyes to see he's a blessing. Just his presence blessed my heart. Well, then God wasn't done Show me how he uses people to be a blessing. There was a young man sitting halfway up to the front, and he had a mental disability. And he was sitting by himself on the edge of the pew, and I am not making this up. In the middle of the sermon, this guy goes, Jesus! And then he grabs his eyelid. And I can't do it like he did because my contact would fall out. But he opens his eye real big, and he scoped out the crowd and I'm like whoo that's different <laughs> so what was so funny to me was the pastor just went on like nothing happened <laughs> so a few more minutes go by and after a while he goes Jesus and he did that eyeball thing again well this went on several times and then Jesus came to me and he gave me his eyes and he said, Anita, do you see how much he loves me? See, the love of Jesus was just all over his face. Now, do you think that young man gets up every day and has a daily quiet time with God first? Nope. I don't think he can do it. But see, God used him to be a blessing to me because of how much he loved Jesus. 
And see, this is what I want to leave you with, with this particular point. We all seek God differently with different ability. But it doesn't matter your ability. What matters is your availability and your faithfulness to just show up with God and let him use you with the gifts he's given you. And trust me, you will be a blessing to others. Our last point for this session, and this really sums it all up. Number eight, if you seek God first, you will have everything, everything you need to make it through this life. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through what? Our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Wherever you are right now, whatever is frustrating you about yourself, you know, maybe you just desire to be a more godly man or a godly woman. Maybe you just have this desire that you want to be a godly father, a godly mother. Maybe you want more of the fruit of the Spirit just coming out of your life. You want more of God's power in your life so you can deal with what life has handed you. I want to tell you right now that you have everything you need. God will answer that. He will cause that to happen, that desire that he has put in your heart by the Holy Spirit. He will bring that about in your life just naturally as a result of you prioritizing spending time with him on a daily basis. You know, all these points that we just went through, that if you seek God, you will start knowing him better, that you will have a transformed mind, that you will do his will, you will have the desire and you will do his will, that you will serve him with the gifts he has given you, that you will become a servant and a witness, that you will have this incredible joy and that you will be a blessing to others and that you will have everything you need. This, my friends, adds up to the abundant life that we all can have in Jesus Christ. It's all ours. It's the reward of seeking God. Thank you so much. I pray these guaranteed rewards will be the final kick in the pants to encourage you to spend time with Jesus every day. It is so worth it. Trust me when I say you will never regret the decision to seek God first.